Hello, everyone. Glad so many of you could make it. My name is Christian Lodgaard, and I'm to blame for products and brands and sustainability within, uh, within Flock. Uh, I just realized that this uh, title is actually impossible to pronounce. Um, so I won't even go for it, but I, I think uh, by the end of the presentation, I'm confident you will, uh, you will understand um, what I'm getting at. But just to, to fly you in and, um, and share some context, um, we're a Scandinavian-based house of brands. Uh, there's seven brands in the, uh, in the collection. Hog is very much the foundation, it's our largest brand, but as you see, there's more. And each of them have uh, unique differentiated uh, positions, uh, unique properties. They address uh, certain preferences or certain, uh, certain segments. Uh, think of it as a puzzle where every place has a piece and uh, no place has two pieces and no place is, uh, is empty. It's, it's quite a, uh, a sizable operation. Uh, we have a market share of 10%, which makes us one of the largest manufacturers of task seating in Europe. We're also a sizable force within, uh, within soft seating. Um, factories uh, throughout, and we sell to 50 nations worldwide. And if you look at furniture from, from above, uh, this is what you'll see. So uh, a sofa or a desk will, will be a bar. Uh, a chair will be a circle. And if you organize them, this is, uh, <laughs> this is what it will look like. And this is where the logo uh, comes from. So this is, uh, this is us, this is the company. Um, it's a house of brands, but it's, uh, but it's, it's one company, it's one organization, and uh, we're gathered by uh, some, uh, some common ideas and aspirations, uh, and uh, by this uh, vision uh, to inspire great work, which is what we try to do for our customers, uh, for our partners, which is what we try to do uh, to each other and within the company, uh, to anyone collaborating uh, with us and to anyone who's listening, willing to listen. This is Flock. Uh, this was Flock, this was us. Uh, but what are we? Well, we are human, aren't we? Uh, and what does it mean to be a human? <clears throat> now, this is a fantastically uh, big question, isn't it? I wouldn't uh, possibly be able to answer, but Platon uh, answered for us. He said that to be, uh, to be a human, uh, is, uh, is about <clears throat> having a, 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 sort of a, uh, a search for knowledge. We want, to, we want to seek knowledge. We take joy in being part of a group. And then there's the concept of soul. Uh, these three uh, sort of attributes make up uh, being a human. And the first two, of course, they are, they are, uh, you know, they are very simple, uh, basic. It's uh, impossible to see anything negative uh, in there. I mean, it's, it's, it's about uh, seeking knowledge. It's about being social beings, uh, which is all fine. Then what about soul? And uh, Platon confirms this, that uh, to that extent that, uh, that we are bad people, um, it's about, it's, about uh, it's, uh, it's in the soul and it's, uh, it's in, uh, in the character. And it says that all, all aspects of being a bad person can be attributed to three, three parts of your, or three aspects of your character. And he said it's greed, it's xenophobia, and it's vanity. Now, if you look at certain uh, international leaders these, uh, these days, you see that it's, it's pretty much a full, a full, uh, full score on those, uh, on those three. And, uh, you know, um, uh, I mean, Donald Trump uh, certainly doesn't do only bad things. I mean, look at North Korea. It seems to have, be having some kind of success in that, uh, that market, uh, or in that, uh, that aspect. But, but there's, there's some tendencies out there which, which are quite, <coughs> quite uh, gloomy, right? Um, international treaties that are being withdrawn from um, that can, can make one a little bit uh, depressed, feel sort of powerless uh, in, you know, in, in facing when we face... Uh, some challenges where we should have been standing shoulder by shoulder and together. And um, what does this have to do uh, with us and with this topic? Well, I think I think a lot because um, if some of our international leaders fail to uh, to um, uh, to take this responsibility and fail to to lead and lead by example in addressing these uh, substantial challenges, it doesn't mean that we don't uh, have to. It means that the place is empty. It means that uh, it's up to, the, uh, to, to us, to, to other people, to put our cheek forward, to stand up for ideals and uh, values that are universal and do better. And uh, 
You know, design and architecture are propositional disciplines. Uh, you know, and that means that we have uh, a certain responsibility um, beyond there because we were actually educated. Our mission, our, our, our jobs is to propose uh, architecture, products, solutions that are better for society. So, you know, there's, uh, there's opportunity in this and there's also responsibility uh, in this and this, this is what we want to, want to capture. And this is actually what, what this, uh, this uh, talk is about. So I told you a bit about the size of the company, how we are big, uh, how we're profitable, how we're growing. But, uh, but the thing is that uh, no customer, no specifier, no architect will ever choose our products, prefer our products because of our size or our profitability or our growth ambitions. Um, moreover, as a strategy, uh, if you tell your people that our strategy is uh, to grow, no one will walk out the room knowing what to do. It provides no sense of uh, direction. So it's quite useless as a, as a strategy in itself. So size isn't really uh, interesting. And growth, for the sake of growth, uh, ironically, doesn't deliver growth unless you, you don't, uh, unless you know what to do. So the only thing that's interesting uh, about size and about profitability is the power, of course, that it uh, provides you, right? I mean, if you're big, uh, if you're profitable, <coughs> then you have the opportunity to, to do more. Uh, and then again, there's opportunity and there's responsibility, right? So uh, it comes, comes with, uh, with some obligations. So how do you address this? Well, you know, the, the, the first and foremost, the paramount is to is of course not to bring out bad products, not to bring out products that people don't need, that are not good for people. So uh, to develop attractive products that are good for people, uh, that last, that people will want to keep, uh, that are designed to repair, that will be repaired and kept for even uh, longer. I mean, this is, this is of course the, uh, the paramount and we, uh, this is very important. The question is whether it's uh, enough, whether you want to do or we should be, we, we should take the responsibility to do more than that beyond uh, making lasting and beautiful products that are good for people. Um, what is a beautiful product? Um, when, uh, when I can't sleep at night, I listen to BBC World Service. Uh, there's uh, quite a, good, a lot of good stuff on BBC World Service. Um, and uh, a few years ago, I listened to an interview of, of uh, Moshe Safdie, the, the architect. So this is the, the guy behind the Habitat 67 and also behind the Marina Bay development in Singapore, you know, with the one with the floating swimming pool. Um, and he said in that interview that uh, beauty connotes humanity. We call a natural object beautiful uh, because we see that its, its form expresses fitness, the perfect fulfillment of function. And then he said, it is inconceivable to me that something which isn't functional is beautiful. I think this is, uh, this is quite well put. It doesn't mean that uh, every form can be derived from function, quite on the contrary, but he says that to, to, for him to, to perceive an object as beautiful, he needs to see that it's plausible that this will work, right? This is maybe uh, the difference between architecture, design and arts. Ed Hawkins is a guy who's been preoccupied with uh, with uh, visualizing climate change. Uh, this is quite a beautiful picture. We used it on, uh, uh, in our Offect exhibition on one of the new products, sound sticks, uh, that are presented in this, uh, this color scale. It's nice, but it's actually a visualization of uh, the global average temperature uh, as it has been developed since recordings uh, began until, uh, until recently. And you know, it's, uh, you know, if you read it as, as, as such, it's quite a striking, uh, striking image, isn't it? Um, and I think you know, we, we, we can all agree that uh, this, this is our biggest uh, challenge these days. Climate change is our biggest challenge. And, and this, you know, immense amounts of uh, waste. Uh, and this is, uh, in Europe, this is a growing problem because the Chinese, they close their border for, uh, borders for, uh, for uh, European waste at New Year. So in the past, we have been sending this waste uh, overseas. Uh, this is not an opportunity uh, any longer. We, we need to deal with this ourselves, right? To take responsibility for, for this and how do we do, uh, how do, we do that? We, somehow we need to, to value this and, as a resource and make sure that it's brought back, back into the, uh, to the cycle. So fighting climate change 
and fighting uh, this mountain of uh, of waste uh, is um, is uh, sort of the, the the primary objectives I think in addressing the sustainability issue. Um, many researchers have pointed out now that. Uh, um, sorting te technologies uh, for waste is, uh, is developing quite fast, um, rapidly. Uh, the challenge is now on the market side, is to find applications, find use for this, uh, this waste. And um, uh, uh, create, make sure that there is actually a market for it, there's takers for whatever is being collected and being, being sorted. This is something we hear quite uh, quite often across uh, industries wherever you go. Uh, people say that well, sustainability has become uh, you know it's it's a given, it's a hygiene factor. Uh, if you if you get a decent uh, product or from a, from a recognized uh, brand, uh, sustainability uh, is taken care of. You know every every serious company considers uh, sustainability these days. And whenever we hear these uh, these statements, I think it's very important to think that uh, this is actually <laughs> bullshit. Uh, this is not true. Uh, this is not true. There's huge differences in um, in how uh, companies uh, how companies uh, practice this. Uh, it's quite important to uh, to realize uh, and to take as a cons as consumers as specifiers also to take the responsibility to look into this and to ask the right question to pinpoint who are actually doing stuff here, who are performing at which uh, which level uh, levels, and uh, who are talking about it but not putting their money where their mouth is. Hmm? Because communicate or sustainability is not is not a communication concept, right? Uh, this is a Disney drawing from '57, I think. It was uh, quite ahead of its uh, if of its time, I would say. Um, it's not a communication concept. It's not about uh, creating marketing stories. It's not about spending all your time on uh, on uh, getting certificates, uh, green logos that you can put uh, put everywhere that are uh, called AFDIM in, in in Australia, called Nordic Eco Label in in, uh, in the Nordics, uh, called Cradle to Cradle elsewhere. Um, it's it's not about uh, communication. Uh, it's about what you actually do. It's about how you actually change your habits uh, from what you did yesterday. Right, the improvements that you manage to, to implement. And how, how, how can you do that then? Well, um, you, know, you, you can develop um, conceptual products that uh, intend to, uh, to uh, inspire different uh, behavior with, uh, with their consumers or their, their users. Um, you can, uh, can develop a collection where there is a model which is a certain exotic material that you can get, which is a close to zero carbon footprint, but it's uh, so expensive that uh, it's uh, hardly obtainable for, uh, for uh, normal organizations or, or customers. Um, and, um, but in then, in, again, intend to, 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 to show the way forward uh, somehow. And, you know, yes, there's a good intentions probably, but I would go as far as to say that this is part of the problem actually, it's not, not a part of the solution. Because, and it's part of the problem because it creates an illusion that you're doing something when in fact nothing is really taking place. I mean, if you don't do sustainable solutions that, um, that are for the many, uh, you haven't really moved things, have you? If you don't think, do things that have a, a certain specific tangible impact, um, if you do an iconic product that no one can afford, you know you haven't really changed uh, anything. So it's it's not about uh, it's it's not about that. Um, you can go circular uh, in the conventional ways, uh, and we have been doing this uh, for uh, for a while actually. This is our Dutch brand BMA, uh, where we've had a take back solutions in uh, on the market since uh, 2013, I believe, to be precise. Um, and it's um, it's uh, it's a system where we uh, where we will offer to buy back any uh, any task chair uh, from uh, of this uh, this model, and this is the most sold task chair in the Dutch uh, Dutch market. So there's a bit above a million, I believe, uh, installed uh, in uh, in the Netherlands of this uh, this task chair. Uh, we offer to buy back any of those uh, for 50 euros, and. We will offer. We will then refurbish it, uh, and we will sell it again uh, on uh, e-commerce platforms and uh, through different uh, different dealers. Uh, and it's you know it's it's the best documented, uh, it's the best communicated circular economic setup in probably the world's most um, circular oriented market. 
And still, after all these years, you know, all we achieve is 2,000 units sold. And you need to relate that to the fact that we produced 1.9 million units last year in total. Right? So this is good. I mean, this is, this is good. And, and this has to happen. And we will continue to develop these kinds of concepts and migrate it to more products and to more markets, find new kind of, kinds of partnerships to, to, uh, to make this happen. But, you know, I, I don't have the conscience, we don't have the conscience to sit around and wait for this to happen, for, wait for our customers to change their behavior. When, you know, after seven years, this is what we've achieved. No, we have to address something. Um, faster. Right? We have to go faster on this. We can't sit around and wait for, wait for this to take so, uh, so long. So the question is, what can we do which impacts much stronger? And what can we do that impacts now? And again, it's, uh, it's down back to the responsibility uh, question, because with this, what we're really doing is we're asking our customers to change. But how about changing ourselves? Right? How about changing our behavior? And seeing if we could do anything without uh, do something without uh, with our with our um, uh, material use and how we how we source sort of the the incoming goods into uh, into our products and see if there's there's aspects in in that. This is actually some, it's actually uh, some concepts that go back uh, quite quite long in our company. We've established circular design principles as far back as in, uh, into, in 1993, and they still, uh, sorry, still remain the same. Um, because the thing is, if you, if you run through uh, the, the carbon footprint of a company like ours, and this will apply to pretty much any, uh, any manufacturing company, you'll find that uh, out of the total carbon footprint that we bring about, not just what we cause directly in our operations, but what we cause Total, you know, throughout the value chains from mining, from raw material extraction and into production and, and logistics uh, outbound. Uh, if you do those, that carbon footprint uh, calculation, you'll find that 90% ish of uh, that footprint can be allocated to the products. Right? So, you know, the fact that I drive an electric vehicle to work in the morning is good, uh, of course. And you know, and, and, and good light bulbs, energy efficient light bulbs in the offices is uh, is good. Uh, we should push that. But compared to what really matters, compared to the products, you know, you're just scratching the surface. <coughs> you know, what really impacts for a manufacturing company are the products. Okay, so then you have to look into how the products are made, and that battle stands when you design them. This will be no different for architecture. Moreover. Um, if you go into these, uh, this, these 90%, what you'll find is that 95% of that, again, uh, can be allocated to materials. Right? So this is, this is really the big, uh, the big issue here. How do you ethically source um, um, your material? That's, that's, the, that's the, big, the big impact. And any other approach uh, to this would not be very truthful. So we try to follow, uh, follow this. We have been following this since, uh, since 1993. And it's about these five principles. Well, it's, if, it's, you know, if it's about the products and if it's about the material, how about using less? How about so making sure that you, use, uh, you design your products to be as, uh, as light as possible? So low weight is a, is, a, is a given. Well, secondly, fewer components. Uh, is a good idea because if you have fewer components, then it will be more efficient to assemble. You'll have a more efficient uh, value chain, and it will be also more um, uh, efficient to disassemble and sort into pure material fraction. Right? So, and if it's about the products and if it's about the materials, how about the right choice of materials? As I said uh, earlier, it must be very important what kind of material you actually use. So, and that's about uh, avoiding harmful substances, of course, but it's also about um, looking after the carbon footprint uh, of that material. Um, and also making sure you can use renewable and recycled materials as much as, uh, as possible. The fourth one um, is also a given when you think of it, uh, long lifespan. I mean, the best would be if the customer didn't need a new uh, set of furniture at all, right? Then we didn't, wouldn't have to manufacture a new one uh, at all. 
would be fantastic, right? So this is why we moved from uh, from five years to ten years warranty uh, quite a, year, a few years uh, years ago, and this remains uh, one of those five uh, circular design criteria to make lasting products. Um, it's about the durability uh, in the product, but it's also about the, about the repairability, right? That the, the products are designed to be repaired, not just uh, discarded once uh, some parts are worn out, but that you can actually change the fabrics, that you can change the fabrics uh, yourself, that there is a spare parts supply. And then, hopefully, once the product has been used, loved, uh, cared for, repaired, uh, used longer, uh, and it's come to an end that it is designed for uh, disassembly. And if you do that right, uh, then there's three, there's three metrics. Uh, you would see good practice on the left column uh, in terms of a reduced climate footprint. You'd see it in uh, reduced uh, resource consumption, and you'd see it on health, uh, on health benefits. So these are the 5-3. Uh, this is the 5-3 concept. The beauty you know, the, the beauty of this is that you can be quite, uh, quite specific and quite scientific. And I think, I think um, anyone who was ever serious about uh, the sustainability challenge of their operation um, somehow reverted to life cycle analysis, right? I mean, it's the, it's the only way to be systematic about it. Uh, run through your operation, see what uh, makes, an, uh, makes an impact. And this, is, this, uh, this can be done. It's not too difficult. And there's even international standards uh, for it, certified ways to do these kind of uh, analysis. It's ISO 14025, and it's called Environmental Product Declarations. And it's quite widespread in the furniture industry, many of you will know. Um, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's actually quite easy. It gives you three metrics on, uh, uh, on the product's performance. And if you want to sort of ethically source furniture, and if you want to source by one metric, you know, how about going after the carbon footprint? You know, this is the, the total carbon footprint that is uh, brought about by through production of one unit complete uh, value chain. Equally calculated uh, for this product from us as it will be from any other supplier. So those of you specifying uh, uh, furniture, if you uh, want to be doing that uh, in an ethical way, you want to be asking for uh, EPDs, uh, you will see suppliers having references to 1425. And if they do, uh, that means that they will have, have this, uh, this documentation. So 14025 is not a, not a certificate in itself. It's a means, it's a method of calculation. It's a way to do this. So the reference is not nothing worth in itself. It's this value which, uh, which is worth something. So let's look into, uh, let's look into this a little, little bit deeper. I said it was about the products and about the materials. So, so what, is, what are right choices then of uh, materials? We keep we keep a list uh, behind here which, uh, which sorts um, plausible material choices into three categories, the good, the bad, the ugly. So the good uh, materials are the ones that we prefer to use, uh, where we see the least uh, problems, the one we should strive for uh, maximizing in the use. So this could be uh, post-consumer recycled polypropylene, for instance. I'll get there in a minute. The bad materials are the ones that uh, we don't really like, uh, but we struggle to find the alternatives. So, I mean, what you're all sitting on now, polyurethane foam, is uh, one such uh, example. It's a, it's a, it's a chemically hardening uh, kind of uh, plastic. It will not recycle. Uh, it can be downcycled, cut to pieces, and glued back together, uh, or it's energy uh, recovery. The problem is it has fantastic uh, comfort properties, and it lasts a long time. Uh, and we don't really find any alternatives which are which can match that. So there are renewable, uh, or there are and there are recycled uh, alternatives, but none of them have the durability of polyurethane. So what does that mean? Well, we have to use some of those too, but we try to use as little as possible, and we're working on substitutions. Mm -hmm. And then it's the the third one is the materials or the processes that we will not use. Right, and this could be, uh, in our case, it could be composites. It could be uh, dual material molding, so that where you combine two different materials into one uh, component in a way that you cannot separate. Uh, it could be uh, ABS plastics, for instance. 
As a designer, I would love to use ABS plastics. It's extremely convenient. You can do pretty much anything. It's extremely precise. But there's chemistry in there that we don't want to be associated with. Right? So we don't, we don't allow ourselves the, uh, this, uh, this uh, opportunity because it's not good. So that's on the negative uh, list. And you know, if you're in a design process, um, what, what, kind of, uh, what kind of impact will your material choices make? And what is this, you know, is this about uh, you know, small variations, small differences, or is it substantial? And on the left, on the right, there, there's a chart of, um, uh, of uh, some of these materials. If you look at this one, this is PA6, this is nylon. Uh, and uh, on, the, on the bottom one, there is the polypropylene. And if you're in, the, in an early stage of product development, normally you can navigate between the two. If you know what you're doing, in most applications, not all, you can go from nylon to polypropylene. And if you're talking virgin material, nylon, one kilo of nylon uh, brings about 9.2 uh, kilograms of carbon equivalent emissions. If you go to polypropylene, you'll have reduced from 9.2 to two, which is substantial, right? But you're still talking virgin. <coughs> so there's still more to do. There's still more to do in terms of addressing the, uh, the, the, the mountain of plastic waste. Uh, and there's also do more to do in terms of carbon footprint, because look at this, it says 0.6. Problem is makes best practice is uh, post-consumer recycled quality that we, uh, that we use in our products. So what I'm saying is that uh, if you're taking these cons making these considerations in an informed manner in the design process, in, most, in a lot of cases, you'll be able to go from 9.2 to 0 0.6 kilos of carbon uh, emissions per kilo material. So it's not details, it's not small uh, little things, uh, you know, it's, it's big impact uh, decisions. Same goes for aluminium. Aluminium is very energy intensive in, uh, in production, in virgin uh, production. The beauty is that if, if you recycle it, there is no electrolysis uh, involved in the process, so you don't have the same uh, emissions, nowhere near. Uh, you're talking in the region of 10%. Uh, so one kilogram of, uh, of virgin aluminium uh, causes 12-ish kilos of carbon emissions. This is a global, global average. But if you go for post-consumer recycled aluminium, you're down to 1.8. Yeah, and this, this you can do. You know, these are choices you can make. These are choices you have to make then, uh, in that case, uh, when you design, uh, and that you have to pull through when you source uh, the material. And it will have a huge uh, impact. So again, the nylon, uh, the plastic uh, example. Uh, Virgin, nylon, post-consumer recycled nylon, 50% drop. But you could also go to polypropylene, and uh, in some cases, uh, even post-consumer, most cases, uh, even post-consumer poly uh, polypropylene, and have substantial savings. Some of you are old, in old enough to remember the first reverse uh, vending machines, right? Uh, remember what you had to do on the reversed uh, vending machine when you came with your bottle and wanted to chuck it in? You had to take off the bottle cap, remember? And this is long, no longer so. And the reason, uh, the, the history behind that is that uh, back in uh, 1995, um, uh, we launched a product called uh, Home Steel with post-consumer recycled uh, uh, polypropylene, and this was actually about the bottle caps. What we did is that uh, we had realized this uh, problem. We had identified that uh, oh, there's a recycling process for the for the PET for the bottle itself, but these bottle caps is a wonderful material has just been thrown away. So we approached Tumra, a global leader in in the production of uh, of reversed vending machines, and said, "Look, are you able to?" to give us this bottle. Can you capture this uh, bottle somehow? Can you identify that material and, uh, and give it to us? Uh, because we will buy it. Uh, and this, uh, this they could. Uh, this is, of course, better for us as, uh, as users, but it's also better for, for us as a company because we were able to get access to very high quality polypropylene, uh, very pure, post-consumer recycled, uh, which would otherwise have gone to, uh, to waste to energy, energy recovery. And it's, um, it's a long time, since 1995. 
by 2016, those uh, bottle caps had become 517 metric tons of post-consumer plastics into our production. So then you're not, you know, you're, you're not talking sort of iconic uh, products or narrow niches in the market. This is, this is substantial figures. Um, we, um, we asked uh, around about those days uh, Sverea, uh, Swedish Research Foundation, to help us um, um, uh, to, to, to guide us on, on choice of renewable plastics. Um, because we had this, uh, this idea, this, uh, this thought that, well, what we're doing on post-consumer is good, but how about going, um, going fossil independent and see if there's, there's a renewable-based uh, plastic material out there, uh, which could replace it all. Uh, sounds like a good uh, prospect, we thought. Uh, but realized we didn't have the competence to choose uh, technology, choose material. So we asked Sverea to help us uh, in that decision. Which material, which kind of process, which raw material, uh, which resource should we try to, um, try to implement uh, to, see, uh, to, you know, to, to, to make the best uh, choice with the highest impact in this, uh, in this situation. And they came back with a very surprising uh, conclusion. Because the conclusion was, don't do it. Don't do it because you're so good with your post-consumer recycled polypropylene uh, anyways, and there's nothing out there, uh, nothing on the market, nothing they knew of in the, in the lab looking into the crystal ball that would come close to the sustainability performance uh, of, uh, of using post-consumer recycled polypropylene. Uh, so that brought us again back on, um, back on track. Uh, and it was, not, it was not, even, uh, not even close. You were talking a factor four higher carbon emissions, even with the, with the best... Uh, best uh, renewable plastic material around, transferred to a Scandinavian um, renewable energy uh, mix, still four times the, uh, the carbon footprint. So, it, you know, it, uh, yes, very surprising. Um, it brought us back on, uh, back on track uh, and led us to, uh, to just put uh, even more fuel into the migration of uh, post-consumer recycled materials into, into production. By 2017, uh, we had increased this, uh, this figure to 607. Uh, we set the target at uh, 700 tons for last, uh, last year. Uh, we're still counting, but I'm quite confident uh, that if we're not there, we're very close. Uh, and this is uh, sort of just, uh, it's, it's like uh, pushing a snowball because uh, once you start working with the opportunities, you find more opportunities. Uh, so what we found out while working with the 700 tons ambition is that, uh, well, uh, this is not enough, is it? Uh, we shouldn't be content about this. Uh, we should uh, look further and now we're reaching for the 1,000 tons um, metric uh, already in, uh, in 2020. So do hold us to it. See you in a few years and uh, we'll see if we made it. This is the ambition uh, anyway. As I said, uh, uh, initially stick our cheek out, um, uh, set some, some ambitious uh, targets, take responsibility, stand up for things that are universally valuable. Uh, this year we're launching uh, RH New Logic. Uh, and I don't want to be presenting that chair, but uh, <laughs> I just um, want to explain you how this comes to life in, in, uh, in a product. Um, so the, the RH New Logic is, uh, is actually addressing um, one of our best-selling uh, products. So in terms of uh, revenue, I think this is the biggest uh, product we have in the, in the company. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a big volume. Um, and it, uh, it's uh, presented to the market first time uh, now on this fair. So of course it represents the latest manifestation of, this, uh, of these five three principles. Um, we, you know, th this company is very much about differentiation. We, uh, we use uh, the power that's provided by size and uh, sound economy to, to invest in our own solutions. We don't buy modules, we don't buy off-shelf uh, solutions, we go our own, uh, our own ways and design every component uh, into, go into every smallest uh, detail to build uh, the differentiation and to make sure that we're doing things right in a sustainability uh, aspect. So there's, uh, uh, there's uh, sourced uh, casters and there's sourced uh, gas lifts, but apart from that, it's all uh, components that we have uh, conceived, uh, designed, specified, 
had uh, tooling produced for and, uh, and <coughs> sourced. Um, so we have full control of all the value chains, of all the components on this, uh, on this one. And it's designed to last, it's designed to be refurbished, and it's designed uh, for this assembly uh, again into pure material fractions. And you can actually do this with, uh, with tools you all have at home. Does it matter? Well, if you compare it to everyday objects, one, one chair, one RH New Logic, uh, it corresponds to 19 uh, kitchen knives. Uh, you can add uh, 335 beverage cans and 145 um, shampoo bottles. I mean, that's a life, life's consumption of shampoo, I think, which goes into one chair, uh, which translates into 1.3 kilos of recycled steel, 8.2 kilos of recycled aluminium, and 5.01 uh, <coughs> kilos of recycled plastics. So that's, uh, that's just one chair. And if you translate that into, into uh, annual volumes of what we plan, you see, again, it's, it's, it's actually quite, uh, quite substantial. And you see why, why we're stretching for the 1,000 tons uh, target. And you see, if you do things properly, if you're thorough, if you leave no stone unturned, you really can achieve substantial uh, results. And these values, when I'm showing these values, you know, 165 tons adding up to... 700 last year, a uh, thousand in a few uh, in a few years. You're talking significant. Um, if you compare it to the capacity of one of the industrial sorting plants, which are being built throughout Europe these days, it's a, you know it's a significant plant uh, part of uh, these plants' capacity. Many of these plants will be, would be completely filled filled with our consumption. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's material which would have otherwise gone to waste uh, you know, in, in, in substantial amount, which is now finding new uh, use brought back into life. And it's you know, implicit in this is that you know, the journey doesn't necessarily stop here. I mean, it's, it's designed to, for disassembly. It's pure material fraction. It can be brought back into, into circle. But remember, this is... Uh, this is the this is the vision uh, to inspire great work. So much more uh, would I be happy if uh, some of this would change the what to, what you guys do, change your practices, make you put your money where your mouth is uh, more than you did um, before this, and uh, and did things which were better. Okay, so uh, before uh, before I open up for uh, for questions. <laughs> Uh, I have one question to to you. Ah, oh, come on. Let's see. Hey, there you go. So uh, my question to you is: Can we create substantial circular economy today? One, two, three. Yes. Thank you.